Hey there, and welcome to Cyberpunk Librarian. I'm Daniel Messer. When you're the kind of person who has a podcast about library technology, two books on the Amazon Kindle store, a third one almost ready to go, along with the history project he's working on, who's finally sitting down to figure out the next chapter of that sci-fi story with librarians, then there's that other super secret short story project he's doing, plus the flash fiction, and a monthly column on library technology for the staff newsletter then you're kind of the person who finds yourself writing a whole awful lot. I don't write nearly as much as I'd like to because of time constraints, being a dad, working at the job, and a lot of other things which are basically excuses and not really reasons. However, I love to write, and I do it as often as I can. The way I write and the workflow I've adopted over the years isn't a common one, but it's not entirely rare either. I do a lot of writing for the web and for the digital realm in general. Indeed, my column in the newsletter is really my first regular print gig that I've ever done. Granted, it's a small print publication, but hey, I've had some wonderful responses to it. The thing is, is even there, even there my workflow doesn't really change all that much. Uh, the biggest difference is the software I do the finishing work in. Rather than finding the finished product in an online editor or content management system, the column ends up in a traditional word processor. Up until that point, my methods remain the same. So for the next few minutes, let's talk about something I dearly love, how I do it, and why, and more importantly, what software I use that might help you when you find yourself in the position that you need to push a cursor across the screen by typing letters that form words, that form sentences, that form paragraphs, that become pages, and wind up with a finished piece. Spoiler alert, though, it all starts at the lowest, smallest level. Indeed, it starts with an atom. This is Cyberpunk Librarian, episode 42, Write the Universe and Everything. My name is Daniel Messer, your friendly neighborhood cyberpunk librarian, welcoming you back to the show that explores the intersections between libraries and technology and is all about living that high-tech, low-budget lifestyle. Hello, hello, Cyberpunk Librarian is back on the net, riding the fiber like the River Euphrates, and surfing the wireless down to your podcatcher of choice. I hope you're doing well and living low stress. For me, it's always wonderful to get back in front of the microphone and talk to you out there in library land. Spring is springing in the land of Arrakis. The birds are chirping, bees are buzzing, and Shai Halud stirs under the ground. Time to start walking without rhythm again. So, hey... I have something new for the podcast, and it all stems from the fact that in the last episode, we talked about goals for the new year. If you happen to miss that episode, you can always check it out in your podcatcher or listen online at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. Anyway, I said I'd be doing my best to keep the lovelies out there up to date with how my goals are coming along, and yes, I have some news and follow-up. I don't think we've ever had follow-up here on the show before. John Syracuse would be so proud. So I'm pretty happy to report that things are moving along really well, almost surprisingly so. I talked about learning some more about coding and the like, and I mentioned, you know, ASP.NET and Python. Well, I am starting to work on those things, but I found myself needing something different, something that required a more open source approach to my problem, and I found myself writing code in PHP and using ImageMagick. Now, chances are, if you've ever worked with some online open source content system, you might have used ImageMagick without even knowing it. WordPress and Drupal both use it, as well as a bunch of other systems. Foss Gallery, uh, you know, Foss Gallery software, like, like Gallery, and Coppermine, 
These, uh, these make extensive use of it to do things like create thumbnails, resize images, and so on. It's a great package for image manipulation. So you can talk to image magic directly through the command line. And that's what I've been doing to manipulate some images and use them to build something new. And right now the project is kind of under wraps. I'm not telling a whole lot of people about it, but it's going to be kind of cool, at least for me. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk more about it later on, you know, later in future episodes. But uh, your command line uh, image magic command can look a lot like a programming language, and it kind of sort of is, but not really. Like I said, it's it's a little weird. Anyway, I made a thing using image magic, and I built the command in a manner that that'll be accessible to a live web app that I've built in PHP. Now, it's starting out as a simple thing at first. But I hope to make it even better and more useful over several iterations. As always, when it's somewhat ready, you will find the code on GitHub. And best of all, this is going to save me a bunch of work. This is going to automate a significant portion of my job. So that's going to be awesome. And a final piece of follow-up has to do with my third book. It's pretty much ready to go. I am looking through what amounts to be an advanced reader copy or an ARC, as we say in library land. So I can fix any remaining errors and take a look at the layout and make sure it looks okay. The funny thing about the funny thing about EPUBs and Kindle files and all of that is that it's kind of like looking at a website through different web browsers. Depending on the device you're using, it can look a little different, even though it's the same bits and bytes. So it, it pays to check it out on multiple devices, which is kind of what I'm doing. But I should have it on the Amazon Kindle store right after, you know, right after that. It's going to be fairly soon. It's called Digital Outback, Cyberpunk and Culture on the Edge of the Net. And it's a collection of essays on, well, cyberpunk and culture. So watch the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Google Pluses and you'll know when it goes live. I probably won't be able to shut up about it for a good week or so. So, okay, that's follow-up. Let's get down to brass tacks. Let's get down to brass tacks here, how much for the ape? We're going to talk about writing today and how to get it done. Specifically, we're going to talk about how I get it done and why what I do isn't as weird as it first may seem. I've been a writer for a couple of decades now, so even if I'm not very good at it, I'm efficient, by God. Last week, I needed to get the column out for the staff newsletter, and it needed to be done ASAP. Actually, it kind of needed to be done last week. But we won't get into that now. That, that, that's for later. These things can be anywhere from 700 to 1,000 words, and I had, maybe, an hour to get it handed in. So I fired up a browser for fact-checking, you know, the fact-checking stuff and the research, launched my writing software, and hammered out 796 words. Then I edited, finalized, and converted it into a docx file because that's what the folks use to make the newsletter. This show... I sat down to write it in the morning around 8.15. By 9.34, I had 1,622 words, and I wasn't really even close to being a third done. As a writer and a tech nerd, I like to play around with various writing software solutions and see what's best for my workflow. You've got to change things up a bit. You've got to explore. If you, if you get into a rut with what you're using, you won't be ready if something new comes along that's actually better. So... By this point, I've written something in almost every major word processing package out there. Word, WordPerfect, Pages, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, Google Docs, Zoho, Caligra, you know, the list goes on. After all this time, I found that I look at word processors as the places you go to finish writing. It's not where you start, and certainly not where you work. So... Let's do that thing that we so often do and split this show into two parts. For part one, we're going to talk about technique, why it works for me, and hopefully why it might help you. After all, librarians typically find themselves writing something sooner or later. Maybe it's an article for their staff newsletter or even a library magazine like Library Journal or something. Maybe it's copy for an event promotion. Maybe it's a grant. For part two... We're going to get into the software I use and why I use what I use. I don't use a big, bulky word processor filled with options that, really, most of us don't need. 
Indeed, the thing I use is excellent for any kind of writing, be it fiction or nonfiction, essays, flash fiction, short stories, or whatever. And as it happens, it also works pretty good for Python, HTML, ASP.NET, JavaScript, PHP, Ruby, XML, and yeah, even Cold Fusion. Interested? Sweet. Let's dive in. So I work in text, straight, plain old ASCII text that I can edit anywhere on almost anything. I do a lot of writing on my iPad, but I also love writing on my MacBook Air. With plain text, I can pick up where I left off on either device, or a different device, or a Windows device, or your device, or a different device of mine, or a Linux server. It doesn't really matter. That's the beauty of ASCII text. I write in Markdown, something I talked about back in episode 35 of the show. Markdown works everywhere, and it gives me the formatting options I need without any of the fluff and nonsense of a full-on word processing suite. When I'm writing, all I really want to do is move that cursor and keep my hands on the keyboard. I don't want to be faffing about with the mouse and formatting and indentations and bulleted lists and all of that stuff. Push the cursor to the right by typing letters. That's pretty much the basis of how I write. I don't need a lot of functionality to to make that happen, you know? Now, lest you think that this is something strange, consider that there are plenty of popular working authors who also write in plain text. Cory Doctorow not only writes in plain text, but uses a Git repository for version tracking. Best-selling author Neil Stevenson is also a plain text advocate and wrote quite the manifesto on the subject called In the Beginning Was the Command Line. Essayist, novelist, and law professor Richard Dooling has a great blog post on the virtues of writing in plain text. I'll pop some links in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast so you can read their thoughts. But the other big advantage to plain text is that you're not going to be left with a document that you can't open because that format is no longer supported or maybe because you just don't have the program anymore. I've been there, looking straight at a WordPerfect document that I can't use because I don't have WordPerfect or anything that could open WordPerfect at that time. You know what opens plain text? Everything. Heck, your web browser will do the job. Now then, One of my favorite tech writers, Andy Anako, has talked about, you know, he's talked about his love of Scrivener, which is a word processor that's kind of like an integrated development environment for writers. It's actually pretty cool as it offers sections for you to build resources, arrange plot points and facts, develop character biographies, and a whole lot more. I even tried that for a while. This is something that's actually aimed at writers. And while I saw the utility of it and why people would like it, it suffers from something that even Microsoft Word has caught up to. You can only use Scrivener with Scrivener. And since there's no mobile version of Scrivener, you can't use Scrivener in the cloud very well or on your tablet or your smartphone. They've been promising an iOS app for something like three years, since I believe at least 2013. But here it is, February 2016, and it ain't here yet. But even with a cool writing app like Scrivener, you're faced with the same problems. You need Scrivener to use it. And if you don't have it, you can't. And you can't use it anywhere you might want to use it. Now, even Microsoft Word works on the iPad now, and it saves your documents to the cloud. So at least you can work on them wherever you like on whatever you like, so long as you have access to Microsoft Word. But meanwhile, Back in your web browser, there are extensions and add-ons to write and edit text. I'll pop a couple of those in the show notes as well. So not only can you open plain old ASCII text, but you can edit it too. You don't even need the internet connection. Kind of cool. So moving beyond the wonders of plain text and markdown, which works fine in plain text as markdown needs to be rendered, but doesn't have to be rendered to be readable and useful. So let's talk about the environment. Of all the word processors, even the ones claiming simplicity like, say, Abbey Word, they they still try and go out of their way to show off their features. doesn't matter if it's a huge feature set or not. Abbey Word is a pretty simple bare-bones word processor. 
but they want to let you know that there are all of these options. Isn't that freaking awesome? Well, no, actually it's, it's not. I've used Word for decades now, and I only use the common options most of the time. So do probably 95% of everybody else. I mean, that's a statistic I've just sort of pulled out of the air. But I, I, I would be willing to bet that over 90% of people using Word don't get into the whole, you know, fancy features. They're totally ignored and go unused because, well, you really don't need them most of the time to write most of what you'd need to write. Right? So why bother? Well, when I'm writing, I like minimalism. I'm not stooping to, you know, diogenesium aestheticism or anything like that. I want something that, you know, is simple. I don't need, you know, I don't mind a menu bar or a sidebar with a project list or something like that. But what I don't require is a bunch of toolbars with little icons running the entire width of the screen, drop downs with formatting options, font choices, and tab after tab of more of the same. So, yeah, none of that helps me write any better. I don't think it helps anybody write any better. I could be wrong, but I can pretty much stand by that statement, I believe. And everything those toolbars offer should be done after the words are complete. After all, writing is words. I know that sounds sort of obvious, but a word processor doesn't really open that up to you, that writing is words. You can format those words at any time. But first, you need to have something to format, right? So my perfect writing software for the last decade has been clean, mostly bare, environments that display, perhaps, a menu bar and a sidebar. Sidebar is kind of nice because you can have different files there and stuff like that. So that's kind of cool. The most prominent features on the screen are all of that blank space to fill with words and a flashing cursor to indicate where I am within that space. For quite some time now, I've used Macdown on OS X and Byword on the iPad for mobile writing. Saving your Markdown files from Macdown into the Byword folder in iCloud means you can pick up your, uh, your writing anywhere. Heck, I started writing this show upstairs on my MacBook, and then I finished most of it writing down, you know, on the uh, kitchen table on my iPad. But on the Mac, I found what could be one of the greatest text editors of all time. It's a pleasure to write with, and it offers lots of options, but it doesn't shove them in your face. And it works not only for writing, but also for coding. And for a guy that writes about tech and for a guy that writes code and writes about coding, that's incredibly powerful. So without any further rattling on, let's take a look at Adam. Adam is a text editor that just kind of, you know, appeared on the scene out of nowhere because there weren't too many people who expected such a thing to come out of GitHub. Yes, that's right. Adam is an editor created by the people at the online repository of open source code used by millions of developers around the world. It's something you kind of expect a bunch of open source developers to put together if you task them with building a text editor, but in a good way. Before we even get started, I should point out that Atom works on all desktop operating systems. Windows, OS X, Linux, it does not matter because it just works. Cross-platform for the win, chummers. So let's, uh, let's hit the look and feel of Atom because that is, after all, kind of what you're going to notice first. Atom is sparse, but not overly so. Me, I'm the kind of guy who likes to look at a dark screen with white text. So I set it up to do that. How did I do that? Easy. Adam uses themes to control how it looks. That's the first thing you need to know about the software after you figure out what it looks like, is that you can absolutely change what it looks like. There are tons of Adam themes out there to suit your tastes and desires. Are you like me? Do you dig, you know, the white text on the black background? Great. Do you dig, you know, classic black on white? Okay. Old school green screen? That's out there. 
Uh, that solarized look that so many editors seem to have these days. It's not bad, but I don't know if I really like it that much. Well, yeah, you can do that too. Just download the theme. But wait, wait, wait. How, download the theme. Okay, how do you download the theme? That's simple. You do it in Atom. Atom isn't like other text editors using themes in that its ability to fetch theme packages lives within the app. Atom works with GitHub repositories specifically set up for it, and themes can be created and uploaded, and then Atom users can just use Atom to get them. So like I said, I like dart screens and bright text. Anything that offers me an option to do that absolutely gets set up to do exactly that. And I mean from, you know, an RSS reader that I use on the iPad to Kindle apps to whatever. If I can do white screen, or I'm sorry, white text on a black screen, yeah, we do that. Within Atom, though, you basically set up two themes. One for the overall look of the app, which is, you know, basically the Chrome, and one for syntax highlighting. In other words, you could have a bright app with dark syntax highlighting in whatever language you happen to be coding. Me, I use the dark Atom theme, but with a neon syntax highlighting theme, and it is gorgeous, my friends. No matter what the language, syntax is highlighted in bright, beautiful, glowing neon colors. And that's not just because I think it looks awesome, but it looks awesome. Um... It looks totally freaking awesome. Yeah, it's it's beautiful. But it's also that, you know, that kind of display is easy on my eyes. So, okay, that's great. But let's talk about coding for a second. Syntax highlighting only works if your editor knows something about the syntax of the language, right? Well, Adam comes set up with some common languages. But here's the greatest part. You can get more. You can ab You can absolutely get more. You can get languages that you didn't think you would want syntax highlighting in. So remember what I said about getting themes through Atom itself? That's how it works with everything. Atom has a built-in package management system that offers everything from different languages to extra functionality. We have some old cold fusion stuff at work that's you know still running around, and I occasionally need to tweak it or fix it or swear at it. Actually, I swear at it no matter if I'm tweaking or fixing it or just looking at it. I kind of just swear at it. Anyway, when I uh, when I opened the cold fusion code in Atom, the syntax highlighting didn't work. No big shock. I mean, it's cold fusion. That's not surprising. So okay, and you don't often you don't often bump into cold fusion on a regular basis anymore. But for giggles, I hit up the uh, the settings in Atom which is where you go to look for packages, and then I searched for a package. And I just did a search for Cold Fusion. And lo and behold, there's there's a language pack for it. My God. So I downloaded it, and, you know, using the language, you know, I'm sorry, using the package manager, I just download it, install it, and it's good to go. I did have to close and reopen the file. It's kind of like how you refresh it. So, yeah. But I didn't have to close and reopen Atom itself, just the file. And when it came back up, boom, beautiful Neon, syntax highlighting. Awesome. So, since I do a lot of work with various languages like JavaScript, HTML, PHP, C Sharp, a little bit more Python than I've been uh, been doing here recently, I just got the necessary packages for those. I just, you know, open up a file and type a little bit of something, and if it, after you save it, because you do have to save it and tell Adam what it is, um... If the syntax highlighting didn't work, you just go get the package to do the syntax highlighting. It's pretty simple. Oh, and when those packages get updates, you just update those parts. So it's modular. So, uh, you know, if there's a uh, update for the PHP syntax highlighter, then that's all there is. Well, I just can download that update. It doesn't, you know, take a whole lot. And when you know that there's, there's an update, you'll know there's an update because there's just an unobtrusive message that shows up down in the lower right corner of the screen to say, hey, there's there's new packages. You you should go get them. It's it's really nice. Like I said, it's got the features, but it doesn't shove them in your face. That's wonderful. Well, okay, okay. What's all this have to do with writing? You know, coding is nice, but we're talking about writing, right? So there are markdown packages available for Atom, and they're fairly freaking sweet, yo. Um 
Yeah, there's there's several. So, you know, do a little searching around and see what you can find. But with the help of a Markdown highlighter, you know, package, because Markdown's kind of a language. It's not really a language, but it's enough of a language that someone wrote a syntax highlighter for it. So, yeah, with the help of a, you know, Markdown highlighter and a Markdown exporter package, I was up and running in a minute or two. Um, headers were, you know, beautifully called out and, you know, italicized content and bolded content was very obvious because it's neon. It's like, boom, here, this is bold. And yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So lists automatically continue, uh, with this, uh, with this, uh, markdown highlighter package and this markdown writer package. So if you're starting a list and you, you know, put the, uh, the asterisk and then a space and then you type a thing and then you hit enter, it automatically assumes that you want to continue this list and puts another asterisk in a space and you can continue your list until you don't need to continue your, continue your list anymore. So it also will indent properly and all that if you need to add subsections to your list. Yeah, it's, that's, that's, fairly, that's fairly cool. Oh yes, multiple files. You have options and those options are amazing. Atom has the ability to do things like tabbed files big deal. So do other text editors. I mean, you know, there's plenty of text editors that do tabbed files, but you know, that's nice though. I mean, you can have multiple files open in their own tabs. Cool. Well, Adam also does split screen. So you can have your files side by side to copy paste or compare or whatever you need. That's great when you're basically just ripping off code from one file to another. You're basically robbing Peter to pay Paul but you're doing some copy pasting. You've got one file open on one side, the other file open on the other. You can easily get between them and do whatever it is you need. Oh, but you see, it goes a step further because each side of that split screen can also have its own tabbed file. So you can have split screen tabbed files. It is a multitaskers, multi-file users dream come true. On my MacBook, I'll have several files open at the same time. For instance, there's, you know, podcasting ideas, and then there's a writing ideas tickler file. There's the thing I'm working on right now, maybe the other thing I'm working on right now, and so on. I can have coding projects open at the same time as writing projects, and all of the highlighting is particular to whatever I'm doing. So if I have, you know, asp.net code in one tab, and then PHP open in another, and this JavaScript widget that I'm tweaking in another... All the highlighting works, and it's gorgeous. So while Scrivener and other solutions purport, you know, sort of purport to be an IDE for writers, Adam actually is an IDE, and it's perfect for this writer. I think you should give it a shot. that wraps up another episode of cyberpunk librarian hey i thank you all for tuning in as always and i hope you give adam a shot i mean even if you just dabble in writing it's worth your time because after all the, the software is free it's free and open source so you know all you waste is maybe a little time giving it a shot to see if you like it or not because at its heart adam is a very simple text editor it really is it offers you a few options that are useful but it's pretty simple but at its core Adam has a lot of features that make it one of the most powerful text editors I've seen in a while. So yeah, give it a shot. Let me know what you think. You can always drop a comment in the show notes at cyberpunklibrarian.com slash podcast. The song you're currently digging on is The Dead of Night by Psychedelic Pedestrian. Earlier in the show, you heard Analgesia by Vir Nocturna, Kelp Grooves by Little Glass Men, and Universal Warrior Special Edition by Gorowski. As always, the opening track is Belly Dance at a Bisu by Ryo Miyashita. Cyberpunk Librarian is hosted on the Internet Archive. That is at archive.org. It is one of the greatest places online, and I seriously mean that. Archive, you know, you think the Internet Archive. They've got podcasts. They've got some old videos, right? Maybe they got some ebooks. They just added a bunch of classic games and shareware from the Windows 3.1 days. And if you're an old school geek like me, you know, you look at that and you think, oh my god, I actually played some of this stuff. But you don't have to look. You can play, too. 
So you should check that out. The archive at, you know, the Internet Archive at archive.org. Those are great people doing great things. And I thank them for hosting this podcast, podcasts like it, and things that are absolutely not like this at all. If you'd like to get your audio in a video format, we are now available on YouTube. You can catch us at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. Or if you would like to interact with me, I totally love it when the listeners contact me and, you know, give me ideas for shows and ask me questions and, you know, just feedback. Feedback is nice. Let's me know if I'm doing something right or not. But hey, check us out at youtube.com slash cyberpunklibrarian, or you can hit me up on Twitter. I am at Bibrarian. That's B-I-B-R-A-R-I-A-N. It's like librarian, but it starts with a B. You can also check me out on Google+. Plus. I am google.com slash plus Daniel Messer. And you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cyberpunklibrarian. But if you are one of my kind where you just want to send an email every so often, well, I'm cyberpunklibrarian at gmail.com. I would be happy to hear from you. And with that, I'm going to sneak on out while Psychedelic Pedestrian brings down the groove in such a lovely down-tempo way. I thank you for listening. I hope to catch you again next time when we got a new show out. I try and get these things out every two weeks, but sometimes life intervenes and, you know, you know how it goes. But hey, try I, I try. Believe me, I really do. And I thank you so much for tuning in and listening to me ramble on. So hey, before I get out of here, it is my obligation to remind you that you do not have to be high-tech to be low-budget, but it certainly helps if you're a cyberpunk. Take care. I'll see you on the next episode.